Now, I'll tell you something. Every, every time I see that clip, it, it chills me. Every single time. And I look at it a lot. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming here. I know it's not convenient. It's not around the corner. I'm really appreciative. Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank, thank you for having me. Um, I, I was on a red-eye flight, so I, I'm, if I'm a little slower than normal, just I didn't, have, didn't get much sleep. So. You know, that's, uh, that, that's sort of my first question, is that, so you're 51. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, no spring, I'm, I think I'm safely not a spring chicken anymore. So help, late I'm, summer chicken, perhaps? I'm 79. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, yes, but you, I mean, you look great. <laughs> so you're 51, and, uh, and you do 16-hour days, and you work seven hours a week, and you fly all over the place. And you go to these meetings constantly, and, uh, and people constantly criticize you for everything. It's amazing to me. I mean, you're changing the world, and you're giving yourself. Why do you do this? So my wife says to me, why are you still working? Why are you still working? What are you doing here? Well, I think that um, what I'm working on has, important, uh, has an important effect on the future. Um, you know, in the case of Tesla, I think it's fair to say that Tesla has significantly significantly accelerated the uh, advent of sustainable energy. You know, uh, before Tesla, no one was doing electric cars, and now, as a result of, of Tesla, I think almost every major car company in the world has, is, um, going, is, is building electric cars, and, and uh, that's, I think that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, but there's still a long way to go uh, to transition the world to a sustainable energy economy, and so so, so we, we still have a lot of work ahead of us at Tesla, but that's, that's our goal there. And then for SpaceX, um, I think it's important for the, for, the future, for the future to be exciting and for humanity's um, existence to be in, ensured over the long term. I think we must become a multi-planet species and a space-bearing civilization. Um, you know, I think the... Um, we're here like four and a half billion years after Earth, Earth, Earth got started, 13.8 uh, billion years into the age of the universe, and it's only now, recently, in the last 5,000 years, that we even we, we invented writing. I would say date the first civilization by when we, there was the first writing, which was um, in ancient Sumeria around five, five or 6,000 years ago. So. We've basically just been here for a very brief instant. We're, a, a blink. A bl we're, all of human civilization is a blink of an eye, if there was an eye, <laughs> in, in, in the, on an evolutionary time scale. So, so I think it's important we take the actions to ensure that the light of consciousness continues, because and, and, should, we should really view consciousness as, as a, a small candle in a vast darkness, so, and it so can easily go out. So, so, you, so you have these missions, uh, and somehow, whenever you have a mission and you have this vision, uh, and you are a visionary, uh, that somehow, whatever you do, you develop other businesses. So when you started SpaceX, you didn't think about satellites. When you started Tesla, you didn't think about robots. When you don't have enough people, you didn't think about robots. Uh, and uh, so, so you didn't think about autonomous driving. And without Elon, there would not be electric cars. Nobody who makes cars wants to make electric cars. They're being forced to make them. In fact, every time they sell electric car, they sell one fewer car that uh, they make money on. And, so, and they have all that money invested in plants to make those other cars. So nobody wants to have these cars except for him. And everybody thought it was going to fail. So, uh, so and, and one of the things you said is that patents are for the weak. <laughs> And you share your patents. Yeah. And, and with other companies, you, of course, on the other hand, when they get your patents, you're two or three years ahead of them. Well, <laughs> um, well I, I mean, I'm joking about patents for the week. I think there, there is a role for patents. Um, you know, let's say if somebody's spent, if some company has spent a lot of money developing a particular medicine and had to go through the expense of uh, you know, stage three medical trials, and then they, then they finally get something that is, that is approved, but, but where the drug itself is, is cheap to manufacture, then I think a patent in that case makes sense. Otherwise, no one would go to the trouble of doing stage three medical trials. 
Um, so there are definitely roles for patents. Um, in the case of Tesla, the, you know, our, our goal is to advance sustainable energy, and so, and we, and we can't just do it by ourselves. We, we need the whole industry to go that way, so we gave them our patents for free in order to help them uh, accelerate electric vehicles. So it must be terrifying to other companies to realize that when we, we make cars, it's $39,000 in cost a car, and uh, we're making $15,000, $16,000 in profit a car. And so we invest $7 billion, and we make $15 billion a year. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah? Uh, and 15, right, 15, a million cars, 15,000, 15, a million a year on a $7 million investment. Shocking. So no one else does that. And when we're, and, and, and here you're telling us how you want to make uh, cars for $20,000 a piece. How do you do that? Well, we've, we've not formally announced um, our next car program, so I, I can't talk too much about our upcoming vehicle program or, or programs that have not been announced, um, but we do expect to make cars that are um, more affordable than the current the Model 3 or Model Y. So, and um, a, a big factor in this is, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think by far the biggest factor is autonomy in, the, in terms of the value of a car, because right now, Cars get driven for about 10 or 12 hours a week, like maybe one and a half hours a day. And um, so, but there's 168 hours in a week. And so if they were autonomous, you could probably drive, the cars could drive for 50 or 60 hours. So you would see a five-fold increase in the uh, utility of the car, uh, uh, you know, that can do autonomy. This is a really, really gigantic thing. It would also mean that there was, we wouldn't need, um, anywhere near as many, many parking lots. Um, and this would also be helpful for the environment because you would need far fewer cars. So um, I misspoke. It was a $7 billion investment for a plant that makes a million cars a year that makes $15 billion a year in profits. So you invest $7 billion and you make $15 billion a year. Who does that? And for a plant that makes you know, things, uh, manufacturing. And so the way this is accomplished is that, so you're doing it with casting right now and casting half of the car and you can soon cast the other half of the car and other companies why don't they try why don't they try to do the do what we're doing in fact one of the executives of another automobile company uh, wanted me to introduce her to you and you did that once at a meeting and now she wants to come visit with her director of engineering at our plant in austin and I presume when I ask you, you're going to say, yeah, bring her on, because you innovate so fast, by the time anyone copies what we're doing, it's gone to something else. What else is there? How, when you're casting, what else is there that enables us to make it cheaper? Are we eliminating a lot of other parts? Are we eliminating functions? What are we doing to do that? To be able, how would we sell a car that's so cheap? I, I mean, I think the full explanation, or at least an, an accurate explanation, would, would take a long time, um, because it, uh, first approximation, a car is made of 10,000 unique parts and process steps. Um, and we've, I, I mean, Tesla's really, I think at this point, um, probably the best at manufacturing in the auto industry, which I think would, would, nobody was expecting. Probably in the history of the world. Probably. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, um, well, I've, I've got this, like, first principles algorithm that I find to be very helpful in, in, any, in the d design and manufacturing of, of anything, um, and people here may find it helpful. Um, the, the, the first thing you should do is, um, make the requirements that you've been given a less dumb. Um, whatever constraints and requirements were given, they were to some degree dumb, and you want to make them less dumb. If you don't do the, start with this, then you, can, you answer the right, you get the right answer to the wrong question. Um, 
And the, the requirements must be given from a person who can explain the requirement, not from a department, because then you don't know who to talk to. Um, then step two is delete the part or delete the process step. This sounds extremely obvious, um, and yet over and over again, we have found that uh, parts were not needed. They were just put in there just in case, um, or by mistake, um, or, or there was a, a step that people, someone thought was needed, but was not actually needed. The, the, this sounds insanely obvious, but we've deleted so many parts from the car that were, did nothing. Um. <laughs> they were just there? Well, yeah, I mean, I can give you like, so many examples. Um, uh, you know, one example was there were three uh, fiberglass mats on top of the battery pack. Uh, they partially covered the battery pack. And th th it was, it was, I was on the battery pack production line, and it was the number one thing choking battery pack production with these with gluing on these three fiberglass mats to the top of the battery pack. And so, so, if, so this is, the reason I, I repeat this algorithm myself is that I, I first did things backwards. First, I try to automate it. Um, then I try to accelerate it, just have the, 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 this go faster. Then I try to simplify it. And only then did I delete it. <laughs> um, because it turned out that the, um, the, 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 the team at Tesla that does noise and vibration minimization uh, so making the making car quiet, uh, thought that the fiberglass mats were there because of the battery safety team for, for battery fire protect, prevention. And then I asked the battery fire prevention team what were they needed for, and they said, oh, noise and vibration. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So, so then we had two cars drive, one w with a microphone in the car, in each car, and you could not tell the difference. So we went to all that trouble for a part that should not exist. Um, and then another, another example was there was a, an, a, 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 again, this was like, a, these were choke points in the entire production system. That's why they, you know, I'm running around the production line trying to fix the production line, uh, just like a maniac, uh, sort of Tasmanian devil, just running around the factory like a lunatic. Um, and uh, let's see, we had the, the, the body production line of Model 3 was at one point stuck because um, that we had a, a laser welding cell to, to w w um, weld a small crosscar beam in the passenger footwell of the, fr of the front seats. And I'm looking at this, this sort of this beam and I'm like, what the heck does that do? Because um, the entire factory has stopped uh, trying, to put, trying to get the, the, this laser weld cell to work. Um, and I'm like, I, I can't imagine what, what a useful thing it could do. And then the team said, the production team said, oh, that's for, for crash safety. So then I, I called the crash safety team and said, is this for crash safety? They said, oh, no, that, w that didn't do anything. We should delete it. <laughs> <laughs> that turned out to be totally useless. But they forgot to tell the production team. <laughs> so, so I mean, it, honestly, a bunch of these things just feel like you're living in a Dilbert cartoon. <laughs> Like, oh no, what's our, what, I mean, any, any, any given company, they should have like, what's your Dilbert ratio, okay? <laughs> it's not zero. <laughs> so, so is this, is this you or is this your call? Dilbert question, <laughs> try to keep it low. So, 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 so is this you or is this, so you do all these different things here. No, that's literally me. <laughs> so do you have, this is, is this a, someone else who did this. I was in the, I was living in the, in, in the, in the factory in Fremont. Um, and, and the one in, in Nevada for three years straight. That was my primary residence. I'm not kidding, literally. Did you keep the couch? <laughs> I, I actually slept, well, I slept in a couch at one point on a, in a tent on the roof. Um, and then, but, but for a while there, I was just sleeping uh, under my desk, which is out in the open in the factory. Um, and, and for an important reason, and it was damn uncomfortable sleeping on that floor. And always, when I woke up, I'd smell like metal dust. We went to visit, and they bought him a new couch. <laughs> yeah, but actually, I stopped using the couch in the, in because there's a little conference room and a couch there. I stopped using the couch, and I just slept on the floor under my desk, so that the, so during shift change, the entire team could see me. And that's important because, like you know, the, the and the, the team, it, like, 
if, 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 if they think that the, the sort of their leader is, is off somewhere having a good time, you know, drinking Mai Tais on a tropical island, which I could definitely have, do, have, have been doing <laughs> and would much have preferred to do. I mean, <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not actually a masochist, I think. Um, but, but the thing is that since the team could see me sleeping on the floor um, during shift change, with, uh, just not with nothing, um, th they knew I was there. And that made a huge difference. And then they gave it their all. So, so the focus is on always lowering cost and providing <laughs> leadership. And, and this company, we're doing a million and a half cars a year, but you expect to do 20. Uh, and, and so what happens uh, in 10 years if you're not there? What happens in five years if you're not there? How does that work? I mean, are there all these people? So at all the engineering schools, the top engineering schools, the top choice of where everybody wants to work is Tesla or SpaceX, yeah. those two places. So do, do we have all these people coming up and fighting each other for the job or they're working together? How do you get people to say, gee, I could buy that real expensive house, but I'm not gonna do that. Boy, I could buy, I could go out on vacation, I'm not gonna. I was, I'm well, we do have that problem a little bit. Um, so, you know, as a company um, has prosperity um, and then people become uh, wealthy, uh, then for a lot of people, you know, that, that once they become pass, sort of independently wealthy, they, they just can't bring themselves to work or just, they don't want to work. And that's totally, you know, understandable. I'm no judgment. Um, and, and so, I mean, I have a lot of friends who, um, who, who are extremely talented uh, and they, they, you know, had some success uh, earlier in life and they just decided, you know, that was enough trauma. Um, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> You know, one of my, my, my good friend of mine saying, like, for, for start, starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my people say, tell me, like, well, what can you do to encourage entrepreneurs to start companies? I'm like, if you need encouragement, don't start a company. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in, uh, in, in SpaceX, and so we have, uh, you know, competitors sort of, I guess, uh, so SLS, and, you know, I, I read about, that's not, you know, I, it's just, it's just Boeing, Northrop, and Lockheed. <laughs> um, and with those guys, when they build the launching pad, it took them uh, like, like 10 years and billions of dollars and we had to build a launching pad, and it cost a few hundred million dollars and did it in six months. And, and then I was interested in how that was done, and the woman I'm talking to says that, uh, Ron, did you see the plumbing when you went there? I said, why should it cost hundreds of millions of dollars? It looks like it's, it's, it's a landing field. And I said, well, did you see what's underneath? Did you see the plumbing? I said, no, they didn't show that to me. And she said, well, you should be aware that there's all these pipes that take away the heat, uh, and then they all deliver fuel to the rocket, and it has to be there at the exact right amount at the exact right time, and if it's not, that doesn't happen, it blows up. And so I said, well, how does Elon know this? And because you hire these great people, and then uh, you ask them all these questions, and then somehow you remember everything I tell you. Is that true? <laughs> um, well, my, my memory for technical matters is, is very good. Um, and I, but but I, I think probably a lot of people don't realize like what I do apes in the time is, is engineering. So, um, you know, it's actually quite rare for me to give a talk. Um, and my day-to-day -day work at SpaceX and Tesla is uh, almost entirely uh, engineering and design. So, um, and, and, and also production. Production is key, but although I consider that to be part of engineering. Um, yeah, so. Um, but Starship is something special. Um, the thing that is, like the, the, the holy grail, like the critical breakthrough needed to make life multiplanetary and for humanity to be a space-bearing civilization is a fully and rapidly reusable rocket, orbital rocket. And so we've, we've gone 
most of the way there with Falcon 9. You may have seen the rocket booster come back and land. Um, and we also recover the nose cone or fairing. Um, but we do not recover the upper stage. So, so we, we, we've gone to the point where we're about, you know, 70 to 80 percent reusable with, with Falcon 9. Um, with the Starship, we're going for 100 percent reusable. Um, I cannot, it's difficult to say how profound a change this will be, but a, a fully and rapidly reusable um, orbital rocket has the potential to drop the cost of access to space by a factor of a thousand. Factor of a thousand. A thousand. Um, and, and I should say also, Starship is, it's a very, very big rocket. It's more than twice the thrust of a Saturn V and uh, about twice the mass. And it's uh, also, the, the entire ship is, to, is designed to land propulsively. So it can land propulsively. To do what I didn't hear? To, to land on its engines, to land propulsively. So it can land on any solid surface in the solar system. So if we can make Starship work, then it, it's, it enables us to, over time, um, get anywhere in the solar system. So why is it so hard? <laughs> why don't other people do the same thing? So everyone says it's impossible. Why is it so hard? And how much harder is it to do what we're trying to do than we're doing with Falcon? Well, so, let's see. Earth's gravity is actually quite strong, and we have a, th we have a thick atmosphere. So with known physics, it is only barely possible to make a fully reusable orbital rocket. Only barely possible. Um, this was a video game. The setting is ex to extreme difficulty. Not impossible, but extreme difficulty. Um, it's, it, because it, it's not like those who have developed rockets before weren't aware of reusability. They were, were, they were you know, fully That's aware of... More rockets. They were fully aware of re reusability. The aircraft and cars are, full, are reusable. Um, it's just that in order for a rocket to be reusable, everything has to be perfect. Um, so you have to have uh, exceptionally efficient engines. Uh, you have to have an exceptionally efficient structure. Um, you need advanced uh, avionics and software. You need, you need a, a very lightweight heat shield for orbital reentry. Um, and then an another key factor for traveling to Mars is you need orbital refilling so that you, you get the ship to orbit and then um, you, you send up tankers to refill the, the ship in orbit just like um, is done by the Air Force with aerial re refueling. Um, those are the things that are necessary and um, it's, 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 it's never been achieved before. Um, there have been many attempts to achieve it, and they've all um, been basically, they all failed, and they, they usually they'd cancel the program partway through once they, they thought it was no longer possible. So, so it's just a very difficult engineering challenge. So, so SLS is supposed to get uh, to the moon. They got a contract in uh, 2010, and it was supposed to be for $10 billion, but it was cost plus. It's now up to $40 billion, and they say it's going to be $100 billion and $90 billion. Yeah. And, and we haven't gotten anything. And, and our, we have, our rocket is 10 meters taller than theirs. And, uh, and, and, and we can reuse ours. Yes. So how can anyone possibly compete if they're not doing what we're doing? How can, that, how can they compete? I don't understand. And how can they get contracts? And then I just saw something from, uh, from NASA, and they said that uh, we're spending $20 billion a year, and oh, by the way, that's uh, 360,000 jobs in all these congressional districts. Um, well, I, I think this, I have to be careful of what I say here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I have enough enemies. <laughs> I, would, I would like to have... To, uh, you know, I think, uh, I, I think, uh, yes, I would like to have a <laughs> smaller, a, lot, a smaller number of companies that want me to die. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
but, but like I said, you know, it, it, what, a big part of this is, is like, what's the goal? You know, in the case of Starship, the goal is um, um, to lower the cost of access to orbit and ultimately to, to Mars and the moon and, and elsewhere to the point where humanity can actually afford to ha become a multi-planet species to the point where we can afford to have a permanent base on the moon and ultimately far exceed the high water mark of Apollo, which was incredible, and I think inspiring to all of humanity, everyone. Um, if, you, if you were to ask people, I think almost in, in any country, not Americans, anyone, what was the what was the greatest what was humanity's greatest achievement in the 20th century, maybe ever? Space. Go to the moon, and that's why they say moonshot as a metaphor, um, because that was incredible. Um, you know, still amazing that that was achieved. I, in fact, a lot of people <laughs> ask me, was it real? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it was real. <laughs> well, it's probably on Twitter. That's where they asked that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that was just an incredible achievement. And I think it's, it's just one of those things that, you know, going to the moon makes you proud to be a member of humanity, you know? It's like, for all, for all mankind, you know? That's, that, you know, it was for all mankind. So, so, so it's amazing achievements. Uh, and, and now we have this Webb telescope that can, you know, I guess the Big Bang was 14 billion years ago, and, and the first light is 13 and a half billion years ago, and our planet's four and a half billion. So, so what do we get out of this? What is the, you know, so I, I so obviously Star Starlink, a really big deal. Yeah. A trillion dollar opportunity, maybe, maybe more. And Hopefully. maybe. Right? And uh, so, so what do we get uh, out of seeing back 13 and a half billion years? What does that do for us? What technology do we develop? Or do what we know? We, we don't know until we do it. Yeah, I think... Uh, yeah. I think like there's two there's two main motivations I think for becoming a multi-planet species and a space-faring civilization and, and and then ultimately going beyond that to go to go to other star systems and explore the galaxy and I think we may find that there's there's many one planet civilizations that died out millions of years ago and never made it to the second planet do you think in your lifetime that happens that I well it depends how long I live um, <laughs> Maybe forever. Um, you know, if I keep, if I keep uh, increasing that enemies list, list, it might not be much longer. <laughs> I mean, it would be deeply ironic if, 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 if it's someone angry on Twitter that takes me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, now <laughs> like, you can keep not. them off Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, anyway, I think there's... The, the, but there's, there's two reasons for life to become multi-planetary, life as we know it to become multi-planetary. I think one is the defensive reason where we, we just, I think we want the, the light of consciousness to not be extinguished if something were to happen to Earth. Where, and, and, you know, in the case of the dinosaurs, they only had to worry about, like, you know, meteors and supervolcanoes and other things. Um, but for us humans, we actually have the power to destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons uh, or, or some sort of, you know, crazy bioterrorism thing. So, um, you know, so, so there's, some, there's some danger that is not zero that could cause the end of life on Earth as we know it. Um, so that's kind of the, the defensive reason to ensure that life is not just, and, and consciousness is, just, is not only on Earth. That, um, that's the defensive reason to, to protect the future of consciousness. Um, then the other big reason I think is that it's exciting, and it's 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 adventurous, and it's ins it's it's inspiring, uh, and makes you, it, it like it makes you think positively about the future, you know. And and life life can't just be about solving one problem or another. That there need to be reasons to be inspired, you know, reasons that that move your heart and say yes, the future is going to be great. And when you get out. You know, when you wake up in the morning, I can't wait to see what happens next, and and I think that's, you know, 
humanity, going to Mars, even if you don't yourself want to go to Mars, and most people don't, just, just watch it. <laughs> it's, it's a tough gig, frankly. Um, this, this would not be a luxury expedition. Um, and, uh, but, but, but you'd be able to w watch it happen, and I think it would just be incredibly inspiring to the world in the same way that the Apollo program was inspiring to the world. Um, and like I said, there's got to be, life can't just be a, about solving one problem or another. We need things that, are, that make us excited and inspired about the future, and that would be one of them. So let's go to tw Twitter just for a minute, and we'll go back to this stuff, which is more interesting to me. Um, I, I, I try to get out of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told I, me you I, wanted I to ask... to get out. <laughs> me back in. <laughs> but you, but, I reminded that scene from The Godfather, basically. But you told me you wanted to ask tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> I try to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in Twitter... Uh, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so I saw this article. <laughs> it says you bought something called Twitter. <laughs> um, and it says, uh, Musk puts off lifting Twitter bans. And so obviously the big deal, in, to me anyway, in, uh, in Twitter is that. So they, we have this incredible, so it was incredibly poorly managed, this business. And, uh, but those guys somehow... Uh, did great for their shareholders by selling it to us. <laughs> and, and, right? But we didn't buy what they're selling. We bought something of what it's going to become. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, I think it's... Uh, most people would say, like, you know, given where, how the market has evolved this year, the price is on the high side. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But that's on basic what it is. Yes. But in terms of what... It, what, what I, I think there is a tremendous amount of potential... Um, that it will be very difficult to achieve, but I think possible. Um, and I think ultimately it could be one of the most valuable companies in the world. So, so when we think about this, in order for that to happen, um, in order for that, so, so I met you and it took me a few years and then I believe in you and your heart, right? Your heart. And so, I, I think you were skeptical. At our first meeting, you were a bit skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, so the way I think about it is that, so I'm trusting you with the future of our country, of the world, actually, when you're in charge of a media uh, like that. And so what I think about is, so how do you prevent, so being Jewish, uh, how do you prevent this anti-Semitism? Or if I were black, how do you prevent all of the... So, so, so how do you prevent the use of the N-word? And when I think about TikTok, and they're able, we're just looking at pictures, to tell what you're going to do. You know, you move your left arm, you move your right arm, what you, other pictures you like. So that's what they do with their software, and they great their algorithm. How can we not have an amazing algorithm? Because we know more about them to do with TikTok, and we ought to know what interests people have. And, uh, and, and because of that, in words, we should be able to figure out words that people are using what that means, and considering what they content they're interested in, we should be able to figure out with software how to moderate this and prevent that from happening. Is that true or not? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I um, totally agree. Um, the, <clears throat> I want to be clear. The, uh, yeah, content moderation the policies have not changed uh, at, at Twitter, and, and it, it is um, not, not okay to engage in hateful conduct uh, on, on Twitter. Um, so, So um, we have had, like, actually, oddly, like, targeted attacks where temporarily people have been able to put some hate speech on, on Twitter, but, um, but then it's been taken down immediately. Um, so now, <clears throat> part of what I'm trying to achieve with this sort of um, enabling everyone to, to be payment verified with, with Twitter Blue is to try to get as many people payment verified as possible, uh, it's only eight bucks a month. Um, although, for some people that were complaining about that, and th these are people who pay more than that for their latte. I'm going to be one of your Twitter <laughs> customers. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, but, 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 like, a, 
it's part of its revenue, part of it is payment authentication. And so if somebody, uh, because w there is a huge problem with spam and, and bots and trolls on, on Twitter and organizations trying to manipulate pu public opinion um, and just, just generally making the system worse. Um, and I think, but I think that there is an answer to that, which is to, to get um, as many uh, regular users of Twitter to um, be a, a subscriber for $8 a month. And you'll get a lot more than just the blue check mark for $8 a month, because now we can afford long form video, long, form, long audio, pod podcasts, um, and we can also start sharing revenue with, with content creators, which is essential. Um, give them a chance to make money. Yeah, absolutely. Just, uh, so, I mean, right now, you, if you're on Twitter, you'll, you'll see a lot of links posted to YouTube and, and TikTok, um, and that's because, at least until now, Twitter has not allowed, even given them enough video length to post their video, um, and then they give the, the content creators no means of monetizing the video. So we're going to change that rapidly um, at Twitter. It's going to be transformative. But, but if we can get enough verified users, and we're going to prioritize um, Twitter search, replies, uh, mentions, um, by verified users first. Um, and, and, yeah. This is very and that's, what get, that's, what, that's what calls amplified? Yes. So, so the, so the, if, if you're payment verified with blue checkmark, then you're pre-prioritized. Um, and so this, this is, the, the point of this is to make crime not to pay. Um, because, um, because right now, to create a, a bot on Twitter costs less than a penny. Um, so the, the, the cost of crime is so cheap, and that's part of why crime um, and, and hateful conduct pays. But if somebody risks losing even eight bucks, they, 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 or you, you, it's, it's too expensive to now have a, a 100,000 fake accounts because they have to spend $800,000 a month um, as opposed to you know, $800 a month. So, um, and then we also, since we're using payment authentication, uh, we're, we're piggybacking on the authentication system of the payment system, and we're also piggybacking off of uh, Apple's authentication system, which is another layer of security. So the, the, the net effect will be over time that the, the verified users will, be, will pretty much always be at the top of, of comments and search, and you won't really see, you'll have to scroll far to see the unverified uh, users, which will be the bots and, and trolls and whatnot. And uh, this is sort of analogous to um, w uh, Google search. Like, um, if you go to page eight of Google search, th there will be a ton of scams and, and, and stuff, you know, call it page eight, page nine, something like that. Um, and the, but the thing is that Google search results are so good for page one that you never go to page eight. Um, so, uh, or it's rare. And like the, the old joke is like... So if something we don't want to see, it gets pushed way down. Yeah, just put, the, the basically the, the, ba the bad stuff gets pushed way down. Um, and, and, and then crime stops paying and then they stop trying to, to do all these things. And we can recruit them as engineers to program for us. Crime guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, the joke is like, what's the best place to hide a dead body would be the second page of Google search results. <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever goes there. So, so today we fired uh, half of, of uh, Twitter. And uh, that should save us, what, $4 billion a year? <laughs> no, it's not going to save $4 billion a year. <laughs> I wish, but... Um, uh, so... Uh, I mean, t to be frank, uh, Twitter was having pretty serious revenue challenges and cost challenges um, before the acquisition talks started. And any company that is dependent on advertising um, has had a hard time. So uh, if you look at, say, Snap uh, or, you know, uh, you know, Google, Facebook, whatnot, they've all had a difficult time with uh, advertising revenue dropping. Um, and t Twitter is more... Uh, you know, currently uh, more vulnerable than they are to uh, advertising because most of Twitter's advertising is large brand advertising as opposed to direct response. So it's kind of like a much more of a discretionary uh, ad spend than it is for, uh, you know, if, like if you, if, you, if you can do direct response for a specific product. Um, so, and, and then we also recently have had a lot of difficulty with um, uh, activist groups uh, pressuring 
uh, major advertisers to stop spending money on Twitter. Um, this is despite us doing everything possible to appease them um, and to make it clear that moderation rules and hateful conduct rules have not changed uh, and we're continuing to enforce them. Um, the, a, a number of major advertisers have stopped spending on Twitter. Um, so this, but this, is, this doesn't seem right because um, we've made no change in our operations at all. And, um, but nonetheless, the activist groups have been successful in, in, in causing a massive drop in Twitter advertising revenue. And we've done our absolute best to appease them and nothing is working. So this is a major concern, because, and I think this is, frankly, an attack on the First Amendment. Um, like, if, if activist groups can pressure uh, advertisers upon which Twitter is fundamentally dependent um, to, you know, su suppress free speech, then that doesn't seem right. I meant, by the way, 400 million instead of 4 billion. <laughs> I meant actually 400 million instead of 4 billion. Oh, yeah. right. um, okay, so, so we're now there. You're living at this place. You go there for the next couple, three weeks. You're going to devote. And then we have a team lined up. You think you have a team lined up you're, uh, to, to manage it. And then you would just do it the same way we do with SpaceX and Tesla, where you just attend the meetings regularly, say, this is what we need to do. Do it. <laughs> well, this is what we need. Yeah, my my workload went up from about I don't know seventy to eight hours a week to probably one hundred twenty. Um, so yeah, I go to sleep, I wake up, I work, go to sleep, wake up, work, do that seven days a week. I'll have to do that for a while. So no choice. Um, but I think. Once Twitter is set on the right path,